Welcome to the Robert H. Smith International Center of Jefferson Studies. My name is John Ragasta. I'm a historian here at the center, and I'm very pleased today to have the opportunity to be here with an excellent scholar and a good friend, Greg May, talking about his new book, A Madman's Will, about John Randolph of Roanoke, who's one of those characters that anyone who does American history has heard of, but you don't necessarily know a lot about. Let me start by introducing Greg. Greg has practiced law for about 30 years in the District of Columbia in New York, uh, graduate of Harvard Law School, a clerk for Justice Lewis Powell, one of the great centrists of the American Supreme Court. Uh, most recently, his book was Jefferson's Treasure, a book about Albert Gallatin, another person who everyone's heard of but don't, doesn't necessarily know a lot about. So Greg, we're very pleased you're here with us today. Thank you, John. I want to start. This book is is has many layers. It has many different things going on, and there's different sections in the book. And so I want to start with very simple. Take a minute and tell us about this book. <clears throat> the book tells the story of uh, John Randolph Roanoke's manumission of his slaves, and it begins uh, with his death, proceeds through um, twelve years of litigation over his will and then follows the freedmen to Ohio, where they tried to settle 3,000 acres of land that his executor had purchased for them, <clears throat> where the local farmers chased them away, and they ended up scattered throughout surrounding counties. So that, in a nutshell, is the storyline in the book. Um, obviously, as John says, the book is about more than just the story. The idea is to use this highly unusual story um, as a way of understanding the attitudes towards slavery, social issues, political issues, all sorts of things um, in the period that were relevant to the story and to the reactions toward Randolph's manumission and the reception of, of the freed people in Ohio. Well, Greg, that's great, because I want to talk about some specific things, but you've given us the broad outline to give some context. So let's start the most specific aspect, which is the will. The book is about a madman's will. There are multiple wills, right. some of which we may have never found. They may, if you, by the way, if in your attic you find a will by John Randolph <laughs> Rano, it would be very interesting. There are apparently multiple wills out there that were never found. The final will, the one that is known, however, was thrown out by the court, uh, which has allowed the will that manumitted the 400 enslaved people. So what was in that will and why did they throw it out? Well, the, the final will, which Randolph had written about 18 months before he died, uh, did not free his slaves. Indeed, <clears throat> it directed that all but 100 of them should be sent to market, as the saying went in those days. And it left substantially all of Randolph's estate to the first son of his favorite niece, a two-year-old boy who Randolph had never even seen. So it was a somewhat unusual will in, in itself, and it was inconsistent with previous wills in which uh, his friends and, and relatives knew that he had freed his slaves. Uh, it, it ends up getting thrown out, <clears throat> I would say, primarily because his family did not really support it. They, of course, presented it to the court <clears throat> and tried to probate it, but they had already decided that they would rather have it thrown out and have Ranoff declared intestate, because in that case, they would each get an equal, there were five of them, an equal one-fifth of his property, and that suited them just fine. They did not want the uh, earlier will, which manumitted his slaves, to be revived because they had no interest in, in the manumission and it was going to cost them a lot of money. Right. So, so they don't want all the money to go to the two-year-old. Uh, so th if they're going to get the money, they have to throw out that will. But then there's this second will, uh, which manumits the 400 enslaved people. Now, the court, when they throw out the first will, presumably knows that. And it struck me as a little unusual for a court in Virginia at that time to throw out a will knowing that the net result was going to be manumitting 400 people. Is that unusual? Or? Well, <clears throat> a couple of things. Um, first of all, <clears throat> it was not unusual. Um, 
the Court of Appeals in Virginia, which is the only court, unfortunately, for whom really good records of opinions have survived, fairly regularly upheld manumissions in wills and the very occasional ones that were done by gift during life um, on the grounds that the manumission statute in Virginia, which was enacted by the post-revolutionary legislature in 1782, was meant to be generous. It was meant to sort of implement a revolutionary notion that freedom was better than enslavement and that even in cases where the manumitter had perhaps uh, not executed the documents in precisely the right way, the court would try to construe them to allow the enslaved people to go free. So um, our retrospective notions that Southern courts were um, you know, stridently upholding slavery under all circumstances is an overly broad generalization. Having said that, I should say that in some other states, the, uh, the Supreme Courts were not quite as favorable to manumission as the court in Virginia was. Um, but the second part of the answer to your question is that the court may have assumed <clears throat> when they struck down the first will that the second will would go down <laughs> too. <laughs> because Randolph, Randolph's sanity had been uh, much doubted and discussed throughout his lifetime. So the family's argument <clears throat> that his final will was invalid because he had been mad seemed not unlikely to be applicable to his earlier will. <laughs> well, well, that's, and I want to talk a little about Randolph's mental state. Because Greg, Greg has heard me describing Randolph in the past, and he knows <laughs> I have questions about Randolph's <laughs> mental state. He's a rather idiosyncratic individual. And the the final will is thrown out. He had just gone back. He'd been ambassador to Russia. And he gets back from Russia, and suddenly everybody, he, he was a conspiracy theorist. All of a sudden, everybody was against him. Everybody was destroying his property. Everybody was, including his enslaved people. But that, and so they tried to throw out the second will as well. The family is trying to throw out the second will. What, can you talk to us a little bit about some of the idiosyncratic? aspects of Randolph that led them to believe they could get the will that manumitted 400 enslaved people thrown out? Well, <clears throat> they had a lot to work with. <laughs> um, <laughs> everyone who had ever known him could tell a story about him that shed some doubt on whether he was entirely rational. Uh, one of his cousins, <clears throat> who had actually lived in the same household with him briefly when they were both young, probably summed it up best when she, in her deposition to the court, said that Randolph was always eccentric and sometimes insane. Uh, and that explains why his range of behavior was, attracted a lot of comment and was likely to lead a lot of people to conclude that he was not entirely rational. Give, um, give some examples of eccentricities. <laughs> We're not talking about a little eccentricity. No, no. Well, <clears throat> um, when he was young, his, his, his most extreme behavior tended to focus on very sudden and probably unjustified antipathies, <clears throat> sometimes toward family members, sometimes toward erstwhile friends, uh, sometimes toward total strangers. And as time went on, um, he became more and more um, self-centered, more aggressive, and more unpredictable. Um, he would also have periods of great energy, perhaps euphoria, and periods of extreme depression. Um, these cycles of behavior, of course, suggest to us a, a fairly clear or, or possible modern diagnosis. I've tried to avoid characterizing them that way in the book um, because understanding his behavior in context requires us to try to see it the way his contemporaries saw it and not the way we would judge it or assess it. And the evidence that comes down to us about the behavior is inevitably no better than those who observed it could make it. It, it, it expresses their worldview uh, 
their understanding of psychology and not ours. Right. And they even used words to describe it in the courts <clears throat> that don't mean today um, what they meant then. The most common characterization at the time was that he was a monomaniac. Um, that did not mean, as we tend to think, um, that he was someone who just focused intently on a couple of things or had peculiar ideas about a couple of things. In the understanding of that time, um, it, was, it was a more uh, generic uh, category for people who um, seemed to be able to behave completely rationally and, and function sometimes extremely well, as Randolph did in parts of his political career. Uh, but they just sort of had gaps or, or uh, parts of their thinking that seemed totally crazy. And, and I, I should have said, we were, we've been talking about John Randolph, and I know many people have heard of him. I should have, he is an important political character. Mm -hmm. He's not simply wealthy and has 400 enslaved people. Um, he starts out as a Jeffersonian in the early <laughs> Jefferson presidency. He's equivalent of the Speaker of the House of Representatives. So he's a, a very well regarded. I guess he was the chairman of the Ways and Means Committee. Right. And um, he was the floor leader for the, the Jeffersonians in Congress. The floor leader. He <clears throat> he then falls out with Jefferson. So this is an important political character as well as being a very wealthy man. And I want to come back to John Randolph and some of his eccentricities, especially vis-a-vis -vis the enslaved community. Yeah. Um, well, and further answer your question, I mean, perhaps I should mention some of his most extreme behavior, which people like to hear about. <laughs> so curious. <laughs> and it did come up in the court. He talked with the devil. Um, he, he, he indeed thought that the devil told him to do certain things, and he told people that. Um, <clears throat> he um, beat some of his enslaved people. Um, in what were clearly fits of rage or some sort of disorder. Um, he almost randomly challenged people who annoyed him to duels, most of whom had better sense than to accept the challenge. Uh, I mean, there were, there were more and more and more things like this. One of, one of my favorites is that his neighbor and good friend, a man named Robert Carrington, suddenly became his great enemy when Randolph's overseer, and of course he fell out with all his overseers, went to Carrington for help. So <clears throat> Randolph posted uh, a sign on the only road that Carrington could take to the river crossing saying that he wasn't allowed to use it. And then he relented, or saying that no one was allowed to use it. Then he relented and posted another sign that said that the following people could use it. And the list included everyone but Carrington. So he does have issues. And the book, by the way, Greg does a very interesting job with dealing with how the courts grapple with mental capacity and mental incapacity at the time. And as he says, in, in the context of the 19th century, the early 19th century of how they would have thought about it. You also deal with the problem of enslaved and African-American testimony. Mm -hmm. um, how does that come into this story? Well, <clears throat> the African-American testimony was not um, really much of an issue in the will litigation itself because there were plenty of white people who could give ample testimony to Randolph's peculiarities. But um, the courts at the time, not only in Virginia, but really pretty much throughout the United States, not just in the South, uh, would not hear the testimony of black witnesses against a white criminal defendant or in a dispute between white persons. Um, and the, the reason that this became um, really important in the administration of justice was that it allowed whites to commit all sorts of injustice and even atrocities against um, African-Americans and basically get away with it as long as all of the witnesses were black. Yeah, and, and the fact, Greg mentions a couple of points, this, this will being contested was going to decide the fate of 400 individuals, and they have no word that they can say. They can't speak right. to it. 
Well, let's come back to John Randolph. So we've talked about the will, and, and we've been talking about Jan, John Randolph. Um, and it's curious that this is a man who wants to free his enslaved people because he's quite an aristocrat, and he's proud of being an aristocrat. Uh, and one example of that, and I'd never heard, those of us who do Jefferson on occasion are familiar with Jefferson's, one of his great accomplishments was eliminating primogeniture and entail. The idea of these great estates would pass to the eldest son. And you can get Randolph hated that. Yes. I've never heard of anybody disliking that. <laughs> what, what's, what's going on with John Randolph? Well, he, he was very um, outspoken in his defense of the old political and social order in Virginia. The aristocratic social and political order that came from the colonial period. Um, in which not, not only was a great deal of the uh, a great deal of the good land owned by a relatively small number of people, but the local county governments, the the county courts, which were not just courts but administrative units, um, were self perpetuating institutions uh, dominated in most cases by only a few families in each county, um, and. Randolph had grown up in that milieu, uh, you know, even after the revolution, that uh, system continued, uh, and he liked it. it. It suited his temperament, his beliefs about his own place in the world, and about how Virginia could function most effectively. Slavery was a piece of that, obviously, um, because enslaved labor was what made that system work in the colonial environment uh, where state, the production of staple crops, tobacco especially, um, was the principal source of the income that sustained the system. Uh, therefore, despite the fact that he ended up becoming a Jeffersonian and in many ways uh, on the hustings, acting as a bit of a populist, if you will. He was at heart, and, and he was not afraid to say so, an elitist. And the relationship to slavery then is very curious, because the other, I want you to talk about his long term. He is a very, for especially a man who is proud of his aristocracy. He is proud of being a Randolph. He has a very interesting relationship with the enslaved community throughout his life. And I was thinking, for example, the portrait of Juba, Mm -hmm. in his home. How did he interact? How was how did he deal with the enslaved throughout his life? Um, the, the portrait that John's referring to is um, the frontispiece of the book. And it's, uh, it's, uh, it's by a well-known artist of the time, uh, Joseph Wood, who actually did uh, portraits of Randolph and many other important politicians of the period. And it's one of the few um, uh, portraits, solo portraits of an enslaved person in Virginia from that period that I'm aware of, um, because enslaved people usually appear in uh, portraits of the period only as sort of background yeah, figures and yeah. family pictures of, of white people. Um, <clears throat> Randolph's relationship with um, his household servants is knowable because he says enough about them, other people say enough about them. Um, that we can we can say something about it. His relationship with um, the enslaved people in who work in the fields is unfortunately sort of opaque to us. But from what remains um, about his relationship with the people in his household, it appears that when he was young and, and more rational than he became later in life, he had um, a sort of matter of fact, um, not respectful, but you know, decent relationship with them. He was not, he was not their friend. Uh, he was an elitist in his behavior toward them. And, and that was clear um, both on the terms in which he presented himself and in the way in which they received him. Um, in the fields, he seems, frankly, to have had very little interest in what was going on unless his overseers abused his slaves so much that he thought that was somehow disrespectful to him uh, and to his property. And then he could get very excited about it. Uh, for example, <clears throat> at one point, he thought that uh, one of his overseers 
was the father of several children from enslaved women. So he calls the man in before a group of the neighbors. He denounces him. He fires him, and then he sues him. But that wasn't honestly, I think, because he was upset about the man's uh, treatment of the enslaved women. It was because he took that as uh, a disrespectful, uh, yeah, disrespectful action toward Randolph as as their owner. Um, so <clears throat> perhaps those shed those incidents shed some light on it. It leads to the larger question. I don't know if you want to talk about this now uh, or, or a bit later in the conversation about well, why did he free them? Well, I think that's exactly where it's going. So you're talking about his relationship with enslaved individuals, but his relationship with slavery as an institution is somewhat different. And he, of course, in this will that's written years before he dies, he manumits the 400. But as time goes on, and especially post-Missouri Compromise, for example, you quote him, these Yankees have almost reconciled me to Negro slavery. You know, the, he, he has, is pulled into, or maybe he creates the antebellum mm -hmm. fixation on states' rights and, and slavery being inextricably linked. Mm -hmm. How does, where does he start and how does he end up where he ends up? Well, he, he, he begins um, with a more enlightened attitude towards slavery. He grew up in a family um, <clears throat> where uh, the possibility of emancipation was discussed. His stepfather, St. George Tucker, was a law professor and a judge, and he presented at uh, one point after the revolution to the Virginia General Assembly, perhaps the only coherent um, emancipation proposal that ever went to them. Um, I'm in that phrase throwing some doubts on what happened in 1831, 1832, uh, but we can get into that later if you like. But um, that proposal, however, was not even heard by the assembly. They immediately tabled it. Tucker continued to publish it in the book that he used for his law students. And so it remained for a generation of, of Virginians, a sort of possible ideal for the kind of gradual emancipation that some of the Northern states had already enacted at that point. Um, his Randolph's brother, Richard, his older brother, for whom he had a great deal of respect, emancipated his share of the family slaves when he died prematurely in the 1790s. Richard was probably influenced by uh, revolutionary ideas in doing that. Uh, and, and Randolph, because he respected his brother, I think took that very much to heart. Um, and then when Richard's sons died and Randolph being childless, um, left the family with no obvious male heirs, the possibility of manumission became uh, more realistic, is perhaps the way I would characterize it to Randolph himself. He was in many ways perhaps the classic example of the kind of person who would manumit not just a few house, favorite household servants, but a whole group of enslaved people at that period. He was a childless son of the revolution. So what shifts? What because he and which is by the way why the family tries to get the the will uh, that he admitted the enslaved people thrown out. They are able to show that between when he wrote that will and when he died, his mind on slavery seems to shift. Right. Well, he he wrote the will that manumitted his slaves um, even after he had begun to shift politically in the Missouri Compromise a few years after that. Um, but you're right that, you know, 10 years later, by the time he died, 10 years later, he, he had drifted a long way. Um, he, his, his political behavior certainly departed from his private views on slavery because uh, he came to realize, I think, that he could use uh, northern opposition to slavery or the desire of many Southerners to defend slavery against that Northern opposition as a political weapon. Randolph in his 
in the origins of his political thinking was not a sectionalist and he was not pro-slavery. He was in favor of small government. He was a localist and an elitist who didn't want a federal government to be able to interfere with that wonderful Virginia political system that we were talking about earlier. And after the Missouri Compromise or in the debates over the Missouri Compromise, it became clear to him, I think, that the slavery issue was going to be a wedge issue with which he could try to keep the consolidation of the federal government at bay. And his attitude towards, his political attitude towards slavery shifted dramatically, I think, for that reason. Now, over time, he may have talked himself into it. It's hard to tell at different stages in his life um, whether he's being sincere, manipulative, or confused. I think this is critical because what we think of as the antebellum mindset on slavery, it, it develops over time and somewhat right. inconsistently. It doesn't appear like this. Well, let, let's shift to the enslaved people, the 400 enslaved people, because um, that is where the book ends and it's very, so powerful. Uh, first, how long is it between when he dies, and, and they know the will, they, they know yes. that it's out there, Yes. between when he dies and when they actually land at Cincinnati? 13 years. So 13 years, these people <clears throat> knowing that this will happen. Tell us what happens when they get to Ohio. Go. You, you mentioned at the beginning, but give us a little bit more of that story. <clears throat> well, uh, the will that manumits the enslaved people is upheld by a Virginia jury in Petersburg um, in February of 1846. And that spring, um, Randolph's executor, uh, William Lee, a Virginia judge, uh, goes west to Ohio to try to find a place where he can settle this group of people who've now grown to 383 or about, about 400 people. Um, Ohio is a common destination for manumitted people coming from Virginia, particularly large groups of manumitted people coming from Virginia. And um, a large group of Virginians had, uh, emancipated Virginians had already been sent to Ohio uh, about a decade earlier um, when uh, an Englishman's will, uh, the will of a man named Samuel Gist, freed about three to 400 people, it's, it's hard to tell, and sent them in two waves to Southern Ohio. So there was, there was a precedent for this. Um, but when Lee gets to Ohio, he, he knows that he's going to have to deal with several things. First, um, Ohio may be a free state, but it doesn't welcome black people. And it particularly doesn't welcome uh, the previously enslaved. There are um, longstanding so-called black laws uh, and I won't go into all the details, which discriminate most uh, discriminate against black immigrants, most importantly, by requiring each black immigrant to post a $500 bond for his support from two Ohio landowners. $500 was an enormous amount of money at the time. Most Ohio farms weren't worth $500. So there weren't that many Ohio landowners who could post the bond, and there certainly weren't many who were going to do it for black strangers. Um, the second problem that Lee knew that he had to overcome was prejudice, because these laws obviously sprang from a deep well of prejudice, and there was lots of other behavior in Ohio throughout the period that made it clear to everyone that um, new blacks coming to Ohio were going to face a great deal of discrimination. Lee is careful about this. He's a, he's a very smart man. He's a lawyer. He has good political connections. So he, he, he's a Whig. Uh, so he connects with some of the Ohio Whigs, people who later became Republicans, um, including uh, uh, one of the most important, politically uh, important Ohioans, a guy named Thomas Corwin. And they all assure him that, yes, these things that he's worrying about are true. 
Um, but that the, the black law uh, bond requirement isn't really enforced, so he can sort of let that go. And that if he will um, sit, purchase land for these freed people and settle them in an area where there already are other freed people, things will probably be okay. So that's what he tries to do. He buys about 300 acres in Mercer County. 3,000. Uh, sorry, th thank you. 3,000 acres in Mercer County, which is on the western border of Ohio, about the middle of the western border of Ohio, um, in a community where um, there is a Quaker manual labor school and already about uh, 60, 70, uh, 80 black families uh, who have established a community. Um, however, <clears throat> the introduction of an additional 400 slaves, uh, sorry, freed people into that county was going to double the black population. And it was a very noticeable bump in the black population of the entire state. So uh, the, the news that uh, a Virginia executor intended to bring 400 previously enslaved people into the state prompted an immediate political backlash in the legislature where um, the, the legislature passed uh, a bill that said that they were going to consider promptly the exclusion of all previously enslaved um, black people from the state. In Mercer County, the reaction was even more dramatic. Um, the, the, the freed people from Virginia landed at Cincinnati and took a canal boat up the Miami Canal, which goes straight north from Ohio toward Lake Erie, um, and disembarked at the uh, canal port in Mercer County, closest to the 3,000 3, acres that they were to settle, only to be met by a crowd of enraged white farmers who were armed, promptly surrounded them, um, guarded them for the night, loaded them back on canal boats the next morning, headed back for Cincinnati, and marched along the canal towpath with bayonets until they had crossed the county line. I mean, the violence, and I, I read a lot of this stuff, but the violence in Ohio at that time sort of surprised me, and, and the reporting of it, mm -hmm. at which I'd be interested in you commenting on, because you mentioned his brother Richard, who his enslaved people who became a free community, it's the book Israel on the Appomattox, right. uh, become this very important free black community here in Virginia before the 1806 law requiring uh, free blacks to leave. Um, and you also talk about the reporting of that, that the violence is ignored the communities are reported as being incompetent, incapable of handling themselves. How does the reporting play out in, in this story and, and what happens to these people? Mm -hmm. Well, you're, you're right, John, that the, 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 the violence in Virginia and Ohio um, has a, a lot in common, um, except that in Ohio, it's almost more overt um, than it is in Virginia, which is interesting. And in Ohio, uh, the newspapers are more unapologetic about it. Um, indeed, the local newspaper in Mercer County publishes editorials at the time that uh, the Randolph Freedmen were turned back, saying that, yes, you know, it's a great pity that we have to turn these people away after they've spent their lifetime working for the benefit of their cruel masters. But it would be even worse to let them stay here and settle among white farmers because that would devalue the farmland, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, not something that um, the, the, the papers in South Side, Virginia ever said about the uh, freed people at Israel Hill, um, although they were less than welcoming to them there. Um, in, in both cases, of course, um, the, the white violence and discrimination is disguised by the tale that the reason the, um, the Randolph Friedman couldn't stay, the reason the, the settlers at Israel Hill didn't do well, is just because they're lazy. You know, it's their fault. Um, and indeed, the story in Ohio, in Mercer County, 
um, by uh, the end of the Civil War was that uh, the Randolph settlers had settled there. And the reason they weren't there anymore was because they were just so lazy, they had decided not to work the land and they had just drifted off to the cities. Um, I know, and we're gonna run out of time and I wanna give people an opportunity for questions. I know you spent a lot of time in Ohio doing research on this book. Did you meet any descendants? I did. Um, they were once a self-consciously constituted group at the beginning of the 20th century. Um, and in 1907, <clears throat> this group of uh, descent, well, not just descendants at that point, but survivors of the migration and descendants actually filed suit in the Ohio courts to recover the land that they had lost in Mercer County. There was another 10 years of litigation, went all the way to the Ohio uh, Supreme Court, and ultimately, as you might predict, did not result in the recovery of the land. Um, so at that point, this, this group was uh, self-consciously aware of their identity. Um, and I don't know how long that um, continued into the 20th century, because um, by the 1920s, after the 1920s, it's hard to find evidence of it. Uh, today, there are quite a number of descendants, but they are no longer sort of constituted as a group. And so, um, and some of them, I assume, uh, may not even realize that they are uh, descended from these, uh, these freed people, um, but some do. And I was fortunately able to, uh, to talk to some of those. Very good. Um, I, in reading the book, Greg and I were talking about this beforehand. Um, I opened up, when I started reading the book, I opened up to the Appendix C, which is the end of the book. It is the manumission register. Uh, it is page after page after page of the names and birth dates to the extent they knew them, ages, heights, information of these 400 individuals. It, it's not, and uh, it, it's powerful, it's, it's depressing. You open to those pages and you are almost overwhelmed. It's not unlike the memorial to enslaved laborers. It's one thing to say Thomas Jefferson owned over 600 enslaved people. It's another thing to see those names and, and the life of these people. Um, the deeply moving part of the book and it's just a list. Um, and now this is, you know, I know that Greg is by training and by his person and I are lawyers. So I'm gonna ask you a question that's not fair to ask for a lawyer, but I'm gonna ask it anyway. Is this a hopeful book? No. It's a lawyer. I've always been intrigued by this notion that we should give slaveholders who freed their slaves uh, uh, a better reputation or uh, more slack than we give those who didn't. And that was one thing that made this story, which I'd actually known about for decades before I finally decided to write about it, made this story interesting to me because it seems to me that that curious idea relates to a larger and more important and potentially more dangerous tendency in the way we look at history, particularly the way we Americans look at history. Um, we tend to be a little teleological in, in, in the way we connect things now and then, and in the way we try to explain what happened or what ought to have happened. And in the way that we have this faith in um, a great arc that bends toward freedom. Um, I don't know that we ought to believe that. And indeed, I wonder if our belief in that allows us to be careless of the freedoms that we do have. I, I, that when I was reading the book over and over again, I kept thinking apathy, mm -hmm. apathy. The problem here is apathy right. there and here, maybe right. very Jeffersonian concept. Right. 
Um, well, I want to open up to questions. I'm sure folks have questions. If you do have a question, we are recording this, so please wait until you have the microphone. We have someone in the back with the microphone, but does otherwise I'll be sitting here talking to Greg till nine o'clock <laughs> if you don't have questions. Any questions from the group? We actually are going to quickly have a question from online, if that's all right. Please. So this is from Jacqueline. Having read Israel on the Appomattox, I am aware of Richard Randolph's freeing of his enslaved laborers. Also, I read about Robert Carter's many missions. Are there any other famous Southerners who did this? Yes. Um, and first, we've mentioned it several times. So I, I should say that um, Israel and the Appomattox is a great book. Um, by a professor at uh, William and Mary, Marvin Ely, and uh, Melvin Ely. And um, I highly recommend it to anyone who hasn't read it. It's a, it's a fantastic book. Um, there were uh, other Southerners who you would have heard of who freed large groups of slaves, perhaps most prominently George Washington, um, who freed about 120, 125 in his will, those, those were the slaves that he owned individually. He could not free <clears throat> most of the people he enslaved, uh, about 150 or 60 more who belonged to his wife and her heirs. Um, I mentioned Samuel Gist, an Englishman who freed a very large number of slaves um, not long before Randolph died. Um, there was uh, a, a prominent uh, Virginian uh, named Mayo. I'm, I'm now forgetting his first name. Some of these manumissions are um, listed along with the sites to the best studies of them in one of the early footnotes in the book. I think it's a footnote somewhere in the introduction. Um, I did not, you know, systematically try to identify all of them. And I'm sure that someone who made that effort could find even more than I found. I was looking for only really big ones. Uh, you know, several hundred. Uh, and I know we have other questions that, that I will forget later. So uh, the book is on sale upstairs. And if afterwards you would like to buy a copy, I'm sure that Greg would be very happy to inscribe it for you. But I saw we had a question here. Yeah, very interesting remarks. Thank you. So you told the story of the slaves being escorted out of the county but then you referred to some of them are still in Ohio. Tell us a little bit more about what happens after they leave the county and how did they get a foothold since they no longer had the land that had been purchased for them? Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, the, the epilogue in the book tries, tries to answer it. Um, they were scattered. Um, they were scattered through the two counties south of Mercer County, um, and most Shelby in Miami, mostly in Miami County, um, where <clears throat> Lee was able to find jobs for them, um, mostly on farms or in households where they would get housing through that first year. Then um, as Lee liquidated the Ohio land and collected other assets, the Randolph estate, he was able to provide each of the families with additional money with which they could purchase land. So beginning in 1847, in the spring of 1847, when Lee goes back to Ohio, um, you can find in the land records a sort of pattern of land purchases, uh, which suggests that he probably gave each of the uh, previously enslaved families about $100. Uh, that was substantially less than he had originally expected that he would be able to do because this whole exercise had wasted a lot of money. Um, but it was that grub stake, if you will, plus support that he gave to um, the freedmen for um, you know, their housing and, and uh, subsistence during that year that got them their start in, in Western Ohio. We have, we have another, another question please. online. Uh, George asks, Randolph would have known Jefferson did not free any of the enslaved upon his death. Did we know if this impacted Randolph's own act of manumission? Or is there evidence this was Randolph's intention well before Jefferson died? It, it was Randolph's intention decades before Jefferson died. Um, and um, by the time Randolph wrote his will, he already... 
could have cared less what Jefferson yeah. thought or did. Yeah. He, he's, he's fallen out with Jefferson <laughs> right. by 1805, 1806. Right. Um, yeah. So you know, he, he he thinks Jefferson is a piker. I don't know how I don't know how he, he would have described that. I'm sure more colorfully. Yeah. Well, he called him Saint Thomas of Canterbury, <laughs> and what he meant by that was that he was just a fraud whose political ideas were nothing but cant. Yeah. And this gives you some indication of John Randolph's character because he, he uh, his first election, 1799, which I'm familiar with for other reasons, uh, he appeared in his first election speech of, after Patrick Henry, uh, and he's a great Jeffersonian. I mean, he's absolutely a devoted Jeffersonian, but it's about six or seven years later, he's he's off the reservation. Right. So, um, other questions? Here in the front. Thank you for coming. This is a real treat. Uh, I've, I've read the book. I'll reread it again. It's, it's simply marvelous. I really have two questions. The first is, when he released those slaves, had he paid off any debt that was attached to the slaves? And secondly, did any of the slaves that settled in Ohio come back to live in Virginia? Well, first question about the debt. Um, Randolph inherited a staggering amount of debt <clears throat> from his father's estate uh, and the estate of his brother and so on and so on. And it took him decades, literally decades, to pay it off. So when he wrote the first will that freed his enslaved people, um, knowing that that debt would prevent the manumission, he actually created a trust that was to hold them and all of his property until the property had generated enough income to discharge the debt so that they could be ma uh, manumitted. By the time he wrote his last emancipatory will and by the time he died, he had paid his debts. And so uh, they were no longer an impediment to the manumission. Um, I'm sorry, I People forgot. coming back to Virginia. Oh, coming back to Virginia. Yes, thank you for asking that question because um, one very important member of, um, of, of the freed people did come back to Virginia, a man named John White, who had been one of John Randolph's uh, principal manservants throughout his life, um, decided after confronting uh, the racial prejudice and exclusion in Ohio in 1846, that he would come back to Virginia. Uh, he thought he would be better off. Um, he was taking a chance. Virginia law said that a previously enslaved person who returned to the state would be whipped and sold back into slavery. But John White figured that his connection with Randolph, and he was a well-known character in his own right because of his connection with Randolph, and his age would see him through, and uh, it did. Um, uh, several years later, he shows up in the Charlotte County, his home county records, as a free person with the legal right to remain. The, the question of debt is also interesting. I want to come back to that because of to give people more sense of John Randall. He, he inherits all of this debt. He and he's very proud of being an aristocrat. He becomes quite wealthy. He's one of the wealthiest men in Virginia and maybe in the country when he dies. He doesn't live like a rich man. No, he doesn't. And indeed, the way he lives is not only a rational response to his wealth, but an expression of uh, his state of mind. He, 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 when he inherits and confronts all this debt, um, that burden, as well as the personal loss that he suffered at about the same time, uh, or personal loss says that he suffered about the same time, lead him uh, to sort of go into a crouch, live in an old rundown cabin at his principal plantation, Roanoke in Charlotte County, um, and adopt a lifestyle that is little better than the lifestyle of most overseers, uh, the very people that he, as an aristocrat, despises. Um, and, and he lives in this very austere, um, sort of uncomfortable way until he pays off his debts and then he begins gradually, well, even before he pays off his debts, he begins gradually to see his way through and he buys lots of books 
Uh, he builds another house so his guests will have a comfortable place to stay. He buys some very nice shotguns. You know, he does he does the sort of but thing. But he still lives in the old place. He, he still has a lives, nice house for his guests. Right. He still lives in the old cabin. <laughs> Did I may be misremembering this, but didn't the Louisiana Purchase have something to do with uh, Randolph's falling out with Jefferson? Was there some connection there? It, it was not so much the Louisiana Purchase. Um, Jeff, uh, Randolph cooperated with Jefferson in trying to get that approved. Um, as Jefferson's trade policies um, in the run-up to the War of 1812, Jefferson and Madison were firm believers that trade sanctions, what we would call trade sanctions, could be used as a way of, of uh, influencing British behavior uh, and stopping uh, British interference with American trade during the Napoleonic Wars. Um, and so on the surface, that was the political trigger that led Randolph into opposition and led to his most extravagant speeches against the uh, Jefferson, Jeffersonian administration, uh, particularly against Madison. But uh, at the end, he pretty openly criticized Jefferson himself. We were, uh, Greg is mentioning his speeches. He is one of the great speechifiers of the early 19th century. And he would, in Congress, give these extensive speeches. And the one I, I pulled out my notes, John Quincy Adams, listening to his final four-hour speech in Congress, said it showed the chaos in his mind. Um, he said was, it had neither beginning nor middle nor end. <laughs> but, but that was, that was I mean, he had changed. I mean, he started, um, again, his first public speech after Patrick Henry had spoken was considered to be a fantastic speech about the Jeffersonian policies. But even, even once his speeches became sort of extravagant and rambling, they, they were compelling and they would, they would draw audiences from uh, the Senate. And he was in the House of Representatives. They would draw audience, audiences from the Senate and from throughout Washington because he had this incredible gift to speak fluently and easily and musically forever and ever and ever. <laughs> Is it true that it was Randolph who caused Congress to ban hunting dogs? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a great story, and I wish I really knew whether it was true. But the story is that uh, at about the time he began to go into opposition against Jefferson's administration and behave uh, a little more eccentrically in public, he used to bring his hunting dogs with him when he came to the House of Representatives. And when Henry Clay became speaker shortly before the War of 1812, uh, Clay represented the, the, the clear opposition to Randolph's point of view in, in the House, <clears throat> and Clay banned dogs on the floor. <laughs> yeah. Did that have some, I think, uh, Randolph wanted to have a duel with Clay. Randolph did have a duel with Clay later. Um, it wasn't the dogs. <laughs> it wasn't the dogs, no, no. The duel was brought on by uh, Randolph's uh, barb in debate that uh, he had been brought down by a combination of the Puritan and the blackleg. The Puritan was referring to John Quincy Adams, who was president at the time, and the blackleg was clearly a reference to Clay, who was a very famous and, uh, and uh, almost addicted card player. Um, and Clay decided that uh, <clears throat> that, was re that was reason for a challenge, and Randolph accepted. Uh, and the most interesting thing about their duel was that after they missed each other on the first shot, Clay insisted on a second. And, and Randolph? Randolph fired in the air after Clay had put a bullet through his, through his coat. I mean, Randolph is... Um... I promised I wouldn't say what I really thought about Randolph. He's an interesting character. He's, He's very an interesting, interesting character. character. We probably have time for one or two more questions if someone wants to uh, ask Greg. You could even ask him a question about Albert Gallup a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> no? I, well, I guess not. Um, 
I tell students when I have the opportunity to talk to students that you know people who don't understand you you write a book unless you're John Meacham perhaps Alan Taylor um, you know if you sell a couple thousand copies it, it, you're doing well with these books you're not getting the point is you're not getting rich <laughs> writing one of these historic books um, but I tell them and when I ask them to read a book and I say why did the author write this book? The author, they didn't do this for the money. They may have done it for tenure. That wasn't an issue for you. Um, why did the author write this book? Why did you write this book? I guess that, that question can be answered in sort of layers. I mean, for, first of all, I had known about this story uh, for decades, ever since I was an undergraduate, and always found it really interesting and potentially very compelling. I was always surprised that it had never been investigated thoroughly. Um, and when Israel and the Appomattox came out now, maybe almost 20 years ago, and was well received, I remember thinking that um, th there probably would be an audience for this story. And so that's, that's sort of when I d decided that uh, it was one of those things I would, I would think about doing when I was able. Um, the other uh, layer of the answer to your question relates to what I said earlier in response to your question about whether this is a hopeful book. Um, I, I, have, I have been disturbed by the way we treat an, slavery and the way that we analyze slavery and, and understand it in our historiography. And I thought that this story provided a way of exploring some of those troubling tendencies in our analysis um, in, a, in a concrete, explicit way without ever really having to say anything direct about it, uh, less about it in the book perhaps than I've said tonight. They can read about it. The book is A Madman's Will, John Randall, 400 Slaves, and the Mirage of Freedom. Gregory May, thank you so much.